going to the gospel of John chapter 15, verse 9 through 17. And I'm going to share a word of the Lord with you. My message this morning is real men pour in. Real men pour in. <laughs> it's going to be rough this morning, bro. Yeah. Real men are not a deficit. Men, real men are an asset. They pour in. We're going to have a good time. Jesus is teaching and he's talking to his disciples about his father. He's having a Father's Day moment with his sons. He says, as the father have loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Listen to that. Don't go to nothing else. As the father have loved me in the same proportion. So means in the same proportion. So have I loved you. If he loved me little, I loved you little. If he loved me lots, I loved you lots. As the Father have loved me, I reduplicated that in my life. What was modeled in front of me, I repeated. So all I did was communicate to you as he has communicated unto me. Later in Galatians, you will hear Paul talking to you about communicating with those who teach you in all good things. And he's talking about giving to people who teach you because you cannot give what was not poured into you. As the Father have loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Next verse. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. So there's a, there's a discipline component in it. It's not just emotion. It's not just love. It's not just feeling. There's a discipline component to it. You can't just turn the kids over to her. Because she's a gifted nurturer. And she will nurture things that she later regrets. That's why there are two of you. And that's why you have to be released to play your role and she plays her role and together we balance the home. I got rules, she's got nurturing. And single mothers have to have both. And you gotta balance it and it's hard. Even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love, he said, I'm abiding in his love because I obeyed. You can't expect God to bless you if you won't obey. If you keep my commandments, Jesus said, as it is with me and my father, so it is with me and you. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Come on. These things have I spoken unto you that, you, that, that my joy might remain in you, that when I look at you, I'm glad. And that your joy, and that your joy might be full. Those are two joys in that text. He said, I've spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you. That I ought to delight in seeing you coming. But I also spoke it that your joy might be full. So when you and I get together, joy meets joy. So that there is no ambiguity about what he means by commandment, he defines it. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Stop right there. If we just did that one, he gave us one commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. If I put up with you, if I'm patient with you, you ought to reflect that patience in the people you love. 
He didn't just say love one another. He said love them as I have loved you. You convicted already. I know, I know right, I can make an altar call right now. Question, is your love a reflection of his? Or a reflection of your selfishness, your frustrations, your desires, your attitudes? Can anybody see Jesus' love in the way you love? Oh, it's going to be tight today. This is my commandment that you love one another, one another as I have loved you. You keep saying you're misunderstood. You're not misunderstood. You mean. You are not being misunderstood, you're hateful. Love is never misunderstood. Who misunderstands love? You nasty. But you absolve yourself saying they just don't get me. No, you don't get you. Greater love have no man than this. Now he going deeper. He going for the throat. That a man lay down his life for his friends. He said the epitome of love is sacrifice. God so loved the world <laughs> that he what? Gave, not took, that he gave. See, men pour in. It's not about taking. Wherever there is love, love pours. Lust takes. A lot of people you think love you just lust you. <laughs> I'm preaching already. I'm all in up in this chair. I'm preaching already. Now he says, ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. And what he commanded us to do was love one another. And God says, you are my friend according to the way you love. If you don't love, you're not my friend. Henceforth, I call you not servant. Oh, here comes an upgrade. Get your iPhone, because upgrade's coming. Henceforth, I call you not servants. For the, 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 this is my only problem with servant leadership. It's a nice term. I get what it means. But the, the, the disciples got an upgrade from servant leadership. He says, henceforth I call you not servants or slaves, for the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. Are the people who work for you servants or friends? Maybe they're not working with you because you don't know how to be nice. You, you don't seem interested in them. You're only interested in goals. And as long as they reach the goal, they're okay with you, but you don't ask them how they are, how they're doing. You don't check on them when they're sick. You don't visit them in the hospital. You don't do nothing for their children. They're servants. You don't tell them nothing. Servants don't know nothing. Servant knoweth not what his master doeth. You don't communicate. They just don't get me. No, you're not doing it right. Jesus says, a servant knoweth not what his master doeth. He says, and I call you no longer servants. I have made you my friends. For all things that I have heard of my father, I have made known unto you. Watch this. This is my good one right here. This is my good one right here. This is me right here. Ye have not chosen me. You think you came to me. 
<laughs> you didn't come to me, I drew you. You thought you came to the potter's house this morning. You didn't come to the potter's house. I drew you to the potter's house. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And I ordained you that you should go. Some of y'all felt funny when I was talking a minute ago about being prosperous. But Jesus said, I ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. Just like I told you in Genesis, be fruitful. I didn't tell you just to be alive, just to exist. I commanded you to be fruitful. That I ordained you to be fruitful. Somebody say, I must be fruitful. And that your fruit should remain. I got to stop here and talk to all the people that are experiencing fruit but scared of it. You're scared to trust it. You're scared it's not going to stay. You're scared the marriage is not going to work. You're scared the promotion won't last. You're scared where you are won't last. God said, I ordain that your fruit should remain. Here it comes with more good stuff. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he, he just going to spoil you. He just going to give it to you. Y'all didn't hear me. You ain't even gonna work for it. He's going to give it to you. How many of you have ever had God give you something? I just came back from Atlanta and they, they gave me a plaque on the sidewalk, name engraved on the street. I thought to myself coming home on the plane, God, I didn't even ask you for that. He said, no, I just gave it to you. Right beside B.B. King and Dr. King and, and Kathy Hughes is T.D. Jakes. I didn't even ask for it. I didn't think to ask for it. It was above and beyond anything I would ask or think but God, God's going to do some stuff for you that you didn't even think to ask for. These things I command you that ye love one another. Somebody say amen. amen. Go back to that first verse. That first verse of nine. As the Father have loved me, so have I loved you. I just imitated him. I just acted like him. As he poured into me, I poured into you. So have I loved you. So have I loved The Father have loved me vulnerably, totally, completely, unashamedly, even though I've wrapped up in sinful flesh and took on the form of a servant. His love didn't lessen because of my form. Why? Is your love so conditional? Continue ye in my love. Real men pour in. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you first of all for the fathers. I thank you for the mothers. I thank you for all the sisters and brothers as we celebrate fathers specifically today. I pray that you might use me as an instrument to encourage, instruct, inspire, renew, increase. Thank you, Lord, for having an open conversation about fatherhood because for many of us, the only model we have of father comes from your word. And you taught us when we pray to say our father and you define what fatherhood is to us because some of us have never been close to a model. There are women in this room that cannot deal with husbands because they didn't have daddies. There are men in here that cannot be fathers because they've never been fathered. I pray that over the next few moments that some glimmering of hope, some, some glistening, uh, uh, flickering light of enlightenment would so touch them that a seed is planted in their heart. I believe you for miracles. Have your way, O oh God, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Let's go to work.
everything begins with fatherhood. The whole Bible begins with fatherhood. It starts out with a father that we call God, Elohim. Elohim, El, God, Him, plural, God in many forms, spoke and let there be. Now, to be totally honest and accurate, God is complete within himself. And when I say father, I'm talking about a position, not a gender. Because he would have in essence been like a hermaphrodite, uh, having both, he is both father and mother. <laughs> he, he is our father, and yet he is the breasted one. <laughs> he is complete within himself, lacking nothing. In order to create, he didn't need anything. He had everything in himself to do what he wanted done. That's why when he created Adam, he didn't have to create Eve. Because Adam was created in the likeness of God, which didn't make him a male. So when he sought a woman, God pulled the woman out of him. And, and when Adam woke up, he said, whoa. Man. Whoa, man, check it out. It's me with an opening. She's a man with a womb. I'll call her woman. The first thing he noticed about it was not her hips, lips, or fingertips. He said, she is my body. She is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. That is why the church is both the bride of Christ and the body of Christ. When God begins to create, he uses the earth as a womb, the planet as a womb, and he injected his seed in the womb of the earth. The Bible says later in Romans 8 that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain. Only a woman can travail in pain. He used the earth as a womb. He used his word as sperm. When his sperm hit the womb of the earth, he said, let there be, and there was birth. And the reason the whole creation can travail is because she has been God's womb. It started with Father God. According to the scriptures, it will end with Father God. The Bible says that Jesus will take the kingdom and commit it into the hands of the Father and God shall be once again all in all. Tell so y'all don't hear me. What I just said might have went over your head. But what I just said walked from Genesis to Revelations. It told you how it started as one. It told you how it will all go back to one. That everything that came forth out of God will go back to God. And God shall be all in all. Complete within himself. Lacking nothing. That's why when we pray, we say, our Father. Everything came out of him. Real men pour in. When Adam is created and Eve is pulled out of him, he breaks the divine order because men were designed to pour in when he started receiving from her. If Adam had not allowed Eve to pour into him, sin would have never come into the world. Sin came into the world because Adam broke the order. We were not designed to receive from women. 
Your self-esteem is compromised when you have to ask your wife for lunch money. I'm not saying you got to be rich. I'm not saying you got to be uh, famous. I'm saying that you have got to be the one who pours in, not the one who takes out. When Adam started eating out of his wife's hand, sin came in because the divine order was broken. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And Adam all of a sudden has allowed the curse to come because he stopped pouring. Women, be careful about pouring too much into us. We are designed to pour into you. And you are designed to take what we pour into you and increase it and make it better. You increase it, you appreciate it, and you multiply it. This breaks all sociological order that the culture we're living in now. Because we are raising up women to be men. And you are not applauded for your femininity. You are applauded in the contemporary society by how tough, rough, nasty, mean, aggressive, hateful, possessive you are and you are climbing the corporate ladder but we are losing our families. I know you can buy your own car. I know you can buy your own house. But until you create a need that I can pour into, I have no place in your life. So stop coming home bragging to me about how much you don't need me and wonder why I shy away. Oh, y'all ain't gonna talk back to me this morning. The conversation has become, let's prove to the men how, in the, how dispensable they are. And it is born out of pain because we hurt you. And betrayed you. And lied to you. And cheated to you. And you became like you became out of pain. But watch what is born out of pain. But Benoni can never be king, only Benjamin. That that is born out of pain is the way you cope with disorder. Insist for better out of me rather than replacing me. Oh Lord, I told you they wasn't gonna like this, Jesus. Let's go from the scriptures to anatomy. Anatomically, men pour in. Life begins when men pour in. We were designed to pour in. You were designed to preserve what is poured in. As it is in the physical, so it is in the spiritual. We are designed to pour in. My wife's brother got sick the other day, really, really sick. And we were out of the country and I knew she was upset because I know her and I know how to read her signs. It's not that she falls apart or anything like that. She has little smoke signals that sent up that says SOS. And if you don't learn how to read the person's signals that you're married to, you can't stay with them. The Bible says dwell with a woman according to knowledge. The better you understand her, the better the chances you are of being able to be with her. So I knew she was upset. I came where she was and I sat down on the bed beside her and I started praying for her. And I started praying for her brother because men pour in. They're not indifferent. They're not deaf. 
They're not tone deaf. They're not emotionally detached. I could have kept doing what I was doing, but I understood as a man and the priest of my home, I didn't pray for her because she can't pray for herself. She often prays for me. But my ability to go in and be priest of my house and be worried about what she's worried about and care about what she cares about is what helps me to be a man that pours in. Pouring in is not just about money. You're not just a father because you sent a check. Let me do two things. I'm getting ahead of myself. First, there is a difference between being a good husband and being a good father. It is possible to be better at one than you are at the other. It is possible to be a better mother than you are a wife. That's why mothers easily align the children on their side because often she's a better, better at being a mother than a wife. And the mother becomes, the kids become her tribe, her support system. The moment she becomes shaky concerning him, she gathers her troops. Talk to me, ladies. She gathers her troops. Sometimes she gathers them because she knows he cares more about them than he does her, and it's a way to give him pain so he can feel what she's feeling. In other words, you're gathering your troops is not only to strengthen you, it is revenge. Since you took away what I love, I'm gonna take away what you love. The only problem is, while you're getting revenge, you're hurting your kids. So you got the child support but you didn't get the child support. The court can make a man pay child support, but they can't make him give child support because child support is not a check, it's attention. Come on, fathers. Come on, fathers. Jesus does not discuss how the father made him rich or famous. He talked about how the father loved him. When you take the father's love from the child, or the father doesn't know how to give love to the child outside of the woman, the child is damaged. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Let me, wait a minute, let me get some water here for a minute. Uh, wait. I came to this glass to get some water, but it had none. No matter how thirsty I am, it has no water. I, I can't get any water poured into me because it had no water poured into it. It is hard to pour into people what was not poured into you. I got this big picture here. It looks good. It's nice, it's fancy, it's cute, it's fine, it's wonderful, and honestly, it's expensive. But it's empty. Just cause you dressed up don't mean you pour in. Just cause you got a Gucci bag don't mean you pour in. Just because you got a fine watch that mean you pour in. You can be fine as wine and have nothing to pour in. And pretty soon we're going to get tired of you being cute. You cute, but you empty, sir. Men pour. (laughs) 
both the glass and the pitcher are empty. And I can't get my thirst quenched from an empty glass. And the glass can't give me water because the thing that was designed to pour into it was also empty. Let me tell you why you're dry. The thing that was designed to pour into you is empty. So Jesus says, move in real close on me, Jamal. Jesus says, as the Father have loved me, So have I loved you. I can't pour into you until something is poured. So what do I do when the person that should have been full is empty or left or died and my thirst have never been fulfilled because they were empty? Have you noticed in the text that when Jesus talks about fatherhood, he doesn't mention Joseph? Joseph is his earthly father. He is in the beginning of the story of Jesus. He disappears early in the story. We don't see Joseph past Jesus turning 12. There are debates about what happened to him, but he is absent. Je Jesus cannot draw from Joseph's poor. Joseph started out pouring because he was called the carpenter's son. Somewhere, the flow broke. I want to talk to some people in this room that somewhere, either by death, abandonment, drugs, whatever it was, the flow broke and left you thirsty. And I guarantee you, if it left you thirsty, man or woman, it also left you angry. Because I don't understand how I could have anything that looked so good and was so empty. So we look good to the community, we look good to everybody, but behind closed doors, you ain't pouring nothing into me. And gradually I become angry with you because you're not being able to pour into me leaves me desperate and thirsty. And then you hit me with commandments and tell me where not to drink, but you dry. How can you be dry and then tell me where not to drink? Jesus doesn't talk to us about commandments before he talks to us about love. He says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Then he talks about keep my commandments. You can't keep commandments if you can't drink. Real men pour in. My, my wife, it took me, it took me about 10 years, maybe longer, to even understand her. I get it, bro. 
They weird. They different. They strange. They not like us. She told me I'd be on the road. Oh, baby, I miss you. I can't wait for you to come home. I thought. Oh. <laughs> 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 never, never mind. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I had a loose moment. I didn't get to take my medication because I was in a hurry this morning and I had to get out of the house. But I flew home with visions. I was going to come in the door. She was going to rip off, you know, anyway. <laughs> I came in the door, she kissed me, say, I'm so glad you home. And went back to watching Lifetime Murders. I went in my man cave, I thought about killing her. I thought, that, no, that, that wouldn't be the right thing to do. That wouldn't be the right thing to do. That wouldn't be the right thing to do. It made me so mad that all she wanted me to do was be home. It took me 15 years to figure out that she didn't want my present. She wanted my presence. Don't get me wrong, she didn't want my presence sometimes. That's how we got the kids. But she didn't want my presence as much as I wanted, you know, anyway. Back to real men, poor here. Where are my fellas that make some noise? <laughs> fellas, maybe because we started out as bucks, we think our real value is what we pull in anatomically. And we have not learned the value of what we give with our presence. just to be there, just to know you're in the house, just to hear your crazy snore, just to know that if a noise breaks out at night, you are there, just for your kids to see what it's like to live with a man stops your daughter from having to go find one to figure one out. Talk to me, girls. May stop your son for looking for male attention from another man. So while we appreciate the check and your anatomical flow, until we get your emotional flow, there will always be a deficit. Because Jesus doesn't start out talking about money and he doesn't start out talking about sex when he talks about his father. He says, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you you. Real men pour in. How your flow, bro? How is your flow? I used to think that the only time kids need fathers is when they're little. but you never outgrow your need for daddy. <laughs> she screamed at me and said, you've been my father, Bishop. We had a Father's Day here several years ago 
and we, we always honored the mothers on Mother's Day. We pinned roses on the mothers. We decided to pin uh, corsages on the fathers. And we gave all the people corsages to pin on their fathers, but there weren't many fathers. So this one little boy got up and walked down the aisle and came and pinned the corsage on me. Because he said I was his father. Now he didn't know how to pin the corsage, so he stuck it into my chest. <laughs> and I was too gracious to flinch. So I bled in silence. And then this grown man, about 38, 40 years old, came down and pinned another corsage on me and said, you're my father too. Until my whole robe was covered with flowers. And what they didn't know is under the flowers, I was bleeding. When I went upstairs and I pulled all the roses off, all of my clothes had blood stains in them because being a father is bloody. It looks rosy on the outside, but it is bloody on the inside. And there are all kinds of books about women and their pain and women and their emotions and women and their careers and women today and the Essence magazine and all kinds of stuff. And when it comes to man's magazines, all they try to do is show you how to be more sexy. Because all they think we are is sperm. So we have no context. Can I teach this morning? I'm not going to shout you this morning. Can I teach you? We have no context when we see the blood. You must understand when the Bible says husbands love your wives as Christ has loved the church. The women are so busy fussing about submission that they didn't read the rest of the verse. Husbands love your wife as Christ has loved the church. Whoa, wait a minute and gave himself men pour in. He died. You talking about submission? You, you ain't gonna submit to nobody. I got the worst end of the deal. He told me to die for you. He told me to bleed within and still stand there. I want to thank every father. I want to thank every father who stood up to the pain and secretly wiped away the blood and didn't quit and didn't run away and didn't hide and stayed, wait a minute, wait, wait, stayed emotionally available while he was personally bleeding because the first thing we want to do with pain is internalize it and the wall we build to protect ourselves from the pins they stick in us won't let their pain in, but won't let our emotions out. And we become numb and die though we are physically present. So just because you have a man in the house doesn't mean he's home. Home is when you don't lose your emotional language because of your personal pain.
Home is when you understand those that you live amongst and can pour into them what they need, even though you didn't get poured into you what you need. And that seems so unfair if you look to her to fill it, you're going to be disappointed because if she admires you, she sees you as such a hero that you make being you look easy. So she doesn't minister to you like she does her girlfriends because she relates to female pain and she has no clue how much it costs you to be you. It doesn't mean she's insensitive. It means she's uninformed. And by the time you start speaking, you are so angry that the point gets lost in the pain. So she may not always be the one who pours back into you. Go back. Your father might not have poured into you. Where is Joseph? Where is Joseph in this text? We haven't seen Joseph since the feast. Where, where is Joseph? Why is, why is Mary following Jesus while he's doing miracles and we see her following him all the way to the cross and we do not see his father? His father missed his football games. His father wasn't there when he graduated. His father wasn't there when he went to the cross. His father wasn't there when he raised the dead. His father wasn't there when he walked on water. His father wasn't there, wasn't there, wasn't there, wasn't there. His mama was always running in behind him somewhere and said, I'm Jesus' mother. Even if I have to sit in the back, I'll still be in the room because I'm his mama. So what Jesus could not get from Joseph, he got from God. Come, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. He should have been able to get it from Joseph. You can't tell me it wouldn't have mattered when Jesus was on the cross if he could have looked out and seen Joseph. You can't tell me that it don't make a difference to see your daddy when you are doing what you do. You can't tell me that you're not looking for him when you're stretched wide and hung high. Instead, he sees mama. And from the cross, he has a conversation with a physical mother but a spiritual father. Come on with me. Somewhere along the way, I'm not indicting Joseph, he could have died. I don't know what happened to him. Somewhere along the way where Joseph let down his heavenly father poured in. So to the men, and I'll close with this. Where do you get the pouring? When everybody in your life wants some more of you and everybody got a thirst, your siblings got a thirst, your children got a thirst, if you got grandchildren, they got a thirst, your boss got a thirst, the world has a thirst, The church has a thirst. Your friends have a thirst. And you say, I don't have nothing left for me. Paul wrote Timothy, he said, I'm about to be offered up. I've given so much away, I'm down to the last drop. Offered up is when the glass has given its last drop. There are some men in this room 
who are burning fumes. You're down to your last drop. And you came to church this morning, you look good, you smell good, you got on your bow tie, you fancy, but the truth of the matter, your cup is turned up. You're about to be offered up. And I wanna pray for you because I want to transition you from looking to people to fill you up. That doesn't absolve them of their responsibility. Sometimes they're gonna get it right and sometimes they're gonna get it wrong. And sometimes they're gonna do it right and sometimes they're gonna do it wrong. And sometimes they're gonna fill you up with what you don't need while they avoid what you do need. And sometimes their timing is gonna be off and you're gonna be empty and they won't even know it. Cause they gonna say, what you thinking about? And you gonna say, nothing. When we say nothing, it is something. When you say to us, what are we thinking about? And we say nothing, we're lying. It just means that what we're thinking about, we don't think you can handle. And so we are silently empty. Paul told Timothy because he trusts Timothy. He said, come before winter. It's cold. I don't even have a coat. I am the greatest apostle of the New Testament. I have healed and raised the dead for people who never gave me a coat. But I trust you, Timothy, because I know you love me. I just hope you get here soon enough. Come before winter, because nobody knows but you that I am empty. to as the father as the father have loved me not Joseph not Mary as the father has loved me in that same capacity I'm able to love you you know what this is very personal I can love some of the craziest people. People that everybody rejected, threw away, thought they'd never be nothing. I, I will take the dark horse every time. And I couldn't figure out why I do that. Even when it's dangerous, even when it's stupid, even when it looks hopeless, I go after them. But then when I read this text, I remembered why. Because I was a dark horse. And as the Father hath loved me, because I was born in a raggedy house on the side of the hill, on the backside of a mountain, to a fighting parents and chaotic circumstances. And because it looked like I would never be nothing. And he poured into me. I can still believe that he can pour into you. I can believe, man, no matter what you did or who you did it with or how long you did it or whether you're HIV positive or whether you're strung out on drugs or whether you're having nervous or emotional problems or whether you're going through crisis, I still believe God has a plan for your life. I believe in spite of you going to jail, in spite of you being locked up in prison, in spite of you disappointing people and letting people down, God still has a plan for your life. And the only way 
I can love like that is because I have been loved like that. And as the Father has loved me, I love the way he loved because that's what he poured into me and, and that's what I pour into you. If you are running dry, come to this altar right now. I don't care how old or young you are. Don't you think for one minute because I'm your pastor, I don't run dry. Don't you think for one minute that I don't get empty? Don't you think for one minute that I don't get tired and want to quit? Don't you think for one minute that I don't want to run away and hide? Don't you think for one minute that I don't ever want to get in my car and keep driving until I run out of gas and figure it out from there? Don't you think that you are unusual or crazy or weak or phony because you run dry? It's not your fault who did or did not pour into you. But it is your fault if you don't learn how to go to God and let him pour back into you.